we're really excited to have you tonight. Uh, this is the second installment in our School of Selling Out. Um, we, we're, really, uh, we're really excited to explore the very tricky intersection of creativity and commerce. Um, that chemistry is, is, a lot, is, is something that causes a lot of trouble. We don't really know how to navigate it, so we're trying to figure it out. And we're really happy to have you here to help us too. Uh, so um, I am Ida, this is Nathan, and we are Wanderlust. Um, this particular talk, we are focusing on spaces um, and venues for creative community venues that um, might not have an obvious uh, business model because the focus is on sustaining a community, becoming a community hub, um, and sustaining various creative practices. Um, we have some really awesome folks here to discuss this uh, with us today. Uh, so you have there's some bios and things in in your program. Um, we've, there's one change, which is uh, Alex Washburn couldn't be here with us tonight. So instead, uh, we have Thad, who also is a designer for works as a designer for the city, uh, urban designer for the city of New York. Um, hosting tonight is Jason Epic from Flux Factory and other creative endeavors. We have Kay Burke from House of Yes. Um, we have Roddy from iBeam. And we have Bob Holman from the Bowery Poetry Club. Thank you guys so much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so tonight, I, uh, you know, spaces is a very sort of broad topic. and. Um, I was thinking about how I wanted to frame uh, what we talked about tonight. And um, we're going to talk a lot about sort of the practicalities of, of a space, of, of renting a space and, and, and using a space for, for creating and, and, for, um, and for making community and, and creating that community. Um, uh, yeah, so, but I, I sort of, I'm a, I'm a transplant. Um, so uh, I grew up in a suburb of Houston. I, I went to school in Los Angeles. So New York was a really um, striking place for me. Um, and I was really immersed immediately in a lot of things that you guys were doing uh, and what a lot of you guys in, in this audience were doing. So that's sort of the framework that I'm going to uh, address this with, is um, uh, how different and, and, and um, challenges we have here and, and how we uh, approach them. So I, I think, first of all, to sort of get to know all of you, um, I want to hear um, about your spaces um, and like some stats, specifically. Um, where are your spaces, where it's located, um, some square footage, uh, what your lease is, if you have a lease, um, and those sorts of things. So if you can maybe talk about um, your spaces. And Bob, maybe we'll start with you. OK, the Bowery Poetry Club is at 308 Bowery, directly across the street from CBGB, if it were there. Um, <laughs> it, when, when we opened our doors um, on uh, Super Bowl Sunday 2002, uh, we weren't much competition for the Super Bowl. In fact, we didn't have uh, bathrooms or a bar even at that point. But we opened because Gregory Corso needed a, uh, a praise day, and we couldn't stay closed any longer. So the doors opened. Um, it's a 2,500 square foot space uh, with a, a storefront on, on the Bowery between Bleecker and Houston. In order to open it, having worked at other uh, poetry venues downtown, specifically the St. Mark's Poetry Project and the New York and Poets Cafe, I knew that uh, to get a space, you had to secure it. So that means buy it. And I put together uh, investors to buy the space, and I'm still a part owner. So the Bowery Poetry Club was considered a sexy little storefront to attract buyers who thought the Bowery would flip in 1999, 2000, which was not the general uh, feel of the real estate market. They were wrong. The club exists. Um, we've gone through a, 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 a major change in the last year because the first 10 years we never really broke even. And uh, now we're working on a new model with a new partner, uh, Dwayne Park, that is a supper theater. 
that primarily has as theater live jazz and burlesque. They're closed on Sundays and Mondays, dark, and uh, so the Bowery Poetry Club reemerges from the shadows to have events all day, Sunday and Monday, say, and the Saturday afternoon. Say we have, how many events, Adam? On, this is, um, over here is Adam Horowitz, who's one of the two new co-executive directors. So six a week times 50 is 300 prior to that. Uh, when we were open seven nights a week, we had 1,500 events a year, say. But the problem was, most of those were to try to keep us open for the 300 events that, um, that were really poetry-oriented. So we were running a venue for the community, great fun and uh, great events. But now, our sustainability model is that we are rent-free. Dwayne Park pays the rent, we hold the lease, um, they sublease from us, and the deal goes that they pay the rent. We get the, the two dark days for our program. That's great. You're touching on some stuff that I want to get to in a minute, but I want to sort of hear uh, everyone else's spaces. But to, to clarify, so you, five days a week, uh, you're not running this. You're not running the events. Just the two days, Sunday, Sunday and Monday. That's it. Are your events? That's yeah. great. Um, Roddy, can you tell mm -hmm. us about IP? Yeah, sure. So um, iBeam is a, uh, it's about a 15,000 square foot uh, uh, warehouse space in West Chelsea. Um, it's been located there, I think, since about 2003. The organization itself has been around since 1997. And it's, a, uh, it's an organization that's dedicated to supporting artists that uh, work with technology <laughs> as well as technologists that um, are making creative work. So it's this really wide span of, of creative professionals from tool makers to people making new platforms that artists can use to um, artists that are thinking critically about the culture's relationship to emerging technology and, and pretty much everything in between. Um, so at the core, it's a residency and fellowship program that uh, supports these people. And last year and uh, generally, we give about $250,000 a year in direct stipends to artists, which is... Uh, it's a good gig and increasingly rare in this city. Um, and in the space, all of our public programming is generated from the work that the, uh, the artists develop. So it's meant to be a combination um, exhibition space uh, as well as a professional development space for the artists to user test new projects, to show what they're doing to the public. Um, we're open Tuesday through Saturday. We keep gallery hours, which confuses um, everyone in Chelsea because we're, we're not a gallery, um, which is thinking of space. Um, we're a little bit the black sheep of that neighborhood. And probably even, I don't know what the next layer, uh, next level worse than a black sheep is at this point. But uh, we're going we're gonna to be moving soon, um, which I think is actually uh, really good for the organization. We're going to be going to a transitional space uh, in Sunset Park um, starting in June. And then we have a nice shiny new building that will be built in 2016 that we're going to move, be moving into across from BAM, sharing a wall with the Mark Morris Theater. So um, yeah, uh, there's a million things that could be said, I think, about space uh, way too much, because that's the kind of everything we do at iBeam at the moment is dictated by the space and, 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 and related to the space. Um, our space is, is amazing and huge, but uh, is, is uh, certainly related to the core of what, of what, the, what the organization does. And it's going to be an interesting uh, transition going into, uh, and a very healthy transition to, to sort of shed that. Great. So. Yeah, great. We'll dive into that in, in just a second. And then Kate, so uh, tell us about House of Yes. Okay. So House of Yes is also going through a transition right now. We operated for the past five years in a warehouse that was 4,500 square feet, located off the Grand Street stop in East Williamsburg. And uh, you're talking about rent, capacity, all Yeah, that all stuff. some number of stats. Yeah, yeah, we could fit about 250 people there for a party. We would have events, uh, three floors. So originally we had people living on the top floor, studios on the second floor, and then event space and circus, rehearsal, school, on, um, and event space on the first floor, and that would transition from day to night. So currently, uh, we are in transition. We just signed a lease on a 7,000 square foot building in, uh, off the Jefferson stop on the L train. So that's currently in the works. Uh, they were just tearing down walls today, which is exciting. <laughs> it's just really exciting to see things uh, progressing. And uh, that's 5,000 square foot indoor, seven, uh, 2,000 square foot outdoor space, which is really exciting. We didn't have that in the previous space. And, um, 
you know, a lot of things are changing between having this kind of underground warehouse renovated DIY space into something that actually has a business plan and permits. So can you, can you tell us? <laughs> can you tell us more about what what you were doing? What kind of programming and okay, stuff was happening? Okay, so the um, uh, currently. Uh, well, at, at version two, and version, then and okay, what will happen so, with version three? Um, so version two, our programming consisted of aerial acrobatic classes uh, during the day and into the evenings during the week, uh, and then. We would rent the space out for dance parties, theater performances, our own variety shows in which the circus performers would perform at the variety shows that would then transition to dance parties that then would transition into the morning, which would then transition into more circus classes. So it would be this kind of rotating schedule of different programming. But um, as years went on, we really found we really found our footing financially in renting the space for events. We would rent to p producers who couldn't find space. They didn't own a space, but they needed to just plug in their programming for a night and have an event. So that's how we really, really created our own market in that way as like a banquet hall, <laughs> you know, for like the underground art. So, so that was great. And as we're transitioning into a space that's a restaurant and a bar and an event space, we're capable of hosting so many more events and so many more theater performances because we have a bar that's not just a folding table with some liquor bottles. I mean, it's going to be an actual bar and, and you know, yeah. and be, be able to actually support the arts through that. So that's one of the things I was interested to hear about is how you make those ends meet. And uh, but I don't know, I don't know uh, uh, that if you have, if you have a space that like sort of philosophically uh, you you can you can sort of own and talk about. I didn't I, I didn't want to leave you out of this no, this, this this. No, you, first you're right. Thing. I I'm I'm not a you know creative on, entrepreneur with a with a great. Uh, these are amazing stories. It's it's great to hear them. Uh, no, I, I work for the government. So I, I told <laughs> I told someone that this morning I was going to something called the the School of Selling Out, and I was like, I, but I haven't sold out yet. I work for the government, and they were like, no. You just sold too low. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll, um, we'll come back. Maybe we'll come back to you. when We sort of have yeah. these sort of these zoning questions or like questions that, or, or I don't know. Do you have something to add? Well, no, I was thinking about what my space is. I, I actually we have a studio in the Department of City Planning, which is kind of like a creative space within a very formal government system of you know the Department of City Planning, but also this whole campus of government buildings around there. So that kind of studio space gives us a little bit of creative flexibility, I think. And my own personal space is I walk back and forth between there and City Hall like all day. And I What's go the from address the of world. your office? 20, 22 Reed Street um, between Broadway and Lafayette. So I walk down back. And my space is really walking back and forth on Broadway all day mm. between the creative long-term thinkers and the kind of let's get it done right now people. Great. <laughs> cool. um, so, so I wanted to, to get to this idea of how you make ends meet. And, and mm -hmm. I, think, I think you touched on something we're going to hear a lot about, which is, which is a bar. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so I, I guess we heard from you. Uh, I'd be curious, Roddy, how, mm -hmm. um, how, how is IBEAM funded? How does that work? By any means necessary. Yeah. And, <laughs> um, it's, uh, I mean, it's a combination like so many, non it's a nonprofit. Um, and like so many nonprofits, it's this uh, stew of uh, city, state, and, and national funding. Um, we've been lucky. We've had uh, individual philanthropists who have been, you know, generous with the organization in the past. So and and continue to be. So we've, we've been quite lucky in that way. Um, and then also we do a lot of rentals, and we've been lucky enough to get uh, fas Fashion Week rentals twice a year, which basically puts Ivy in exile in coffee shops all over the city um, during those those two weeks. But um, is you know a major income generator and allows us to actually you know give money to artists. So I mean we've, you know that's been a, quite a good situation for us and uh, that's uh, so yeah it's a combination of all of the above right and Bob well I'm interested in because uh, uh, there's a way in which the Bowery Poetry Club also um, has an income stream through these rentals and it's almost in New York as if you do have a space you become a landlord for the arts if you're in the arts mm -hmm. you know what I mean um, and I hadn't really thought thought of that when I started off at the St. Mark's Poetry Project, which is still there, and one of the, I guess, the St. Mark's Poetry Project was started in 1966, uh, which was the same year that the New York State Council on the Arts was started. Most of these nonprofit organizations started at the same time that the State Council and the National Endowment for the Arts started. 
So that's, it, it, it was a, you know, it was that kind of uh, syncretic uh, growth between the nonprofit world and the people who are, the, especially governmental places that were funding the arts that created this little world that we live in now. Um, we have found this method of sustainability, which is called, you don't pay the rent. I mean, we have rented the whole space now to somebody else who pays the rent, gets a, a good rate for that because uh, I start, you know, got the space and fixed it up and you know, do it. So they get a decent rate on a, on a hot neighborhood in New York and we're able to sustain ourselves for the next eight or nine years. Now, I don't know what's gonna happen after that, but like everybody else here, I think you start to think that far out, which is also new and different from the way the world was when I was working at the St. Mark's Poetry Project or the New Eureka Poets Cafe. And uh, when you think about that, I think about how our building, for example, has air rights of three flights above. Oh, I didn't even know what air rights were, you know, but now this is all part of the gestalt that we're living in is uh, really what is this new New York and uh, What's, you know, how are the arts going to uh, fit into it? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. But we basically are a bar, or we were for the 10 years, you know, the same way that the New Eurekan was a, a bar also, that um, we're, that, and that was the and, main support. And you still weren't breaking even with, with that bar, that was still at a loss? No, we were probably uh, the only bar to open Manhattan that was going broke. <laughs> <laughs> they say you can't do that. <laughs> with poetry in the mix, you know. Prove them wrong. <laughs> Right. Um, I, I, you know, I, I do want to ask, I'd be curious to hear what you guys pay in rent, if, if you're willing to share that with us. I think that's like a reality that um, those of us who... Um, Personally? Or? No, no uh, <laughs> uh, just, I mean, you know, we can be an open bucket. Because um, I, I, I think that's sort of a daunting thing that we don't sort of have a measure on. Um, and I'll start. At Flux Factory, um, we have an 8,000 square foot place, and we pay about 110,000. Um, for in Long Island City, you said you paid 110 a year. Wait. A year. A year. A year. I'm sorry. I'm you sorry. said that's. Pr I was like, yeah, you're, sorry. Getting, you're getting wrong. We're getting top. Sorry. A year. A year. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah. Not a good deal. Which is about so it's about 10k. 10k. How much space did you say? It's about 8,000 square feet in Long Island City. Okay. Anyone else? Uh, we pay. We're our new lease. We just signed about a month and a half ago. Is 14,000 little less than 14,000 a month for 7,000 square feet. Um, and it's for a 10-year lease, which is what you're talking about, foreseeable future, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, we've been very lucky. We haven't had to pay rent in the space that we've had because the foundation that owns it has allowed us to use it. Um, but I would you know, like to say that the money that we probably would have paid for rent goes directly to artists, which is about 25% of our budget. So that's great. That's how we think of it. How much is your new building? Oh God, I don't. I, that's above my pay grade. I don't know. It's <laughs> a lot. Yeah. 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 But you're building it, and it's being built for the organization. It's well, it's it's a shared uh, living space. It's you know, and then we'll we'll basically have the bottom floor for ourselves, and we will own the bottom floor. Um, part of the sale of the current building that we're in is going towards a capital campaign to to raise money for that. So um, we've been able to bring some amazing architects on to help us think about the the new space, which is absolutely exciting. And just to think about, you know, how can you make a space actually fit what you want the organization to do? That's a luxury that we have never had before. And, and as I'm sure you know too, like that's a really, really exciting uh, way, to, way to think about things. Um, so, yeah. And you, you own, but? I own, I live in it. I live on the third floor above the shop, you know. Um, I, and because this is not our rent, I'm not gonna, talk about the other guys here, but I will say this, it's, um, it's, less, it's less than people here are paying, but, um, no, is that right, or is it more? I can't even remember. But what I do remember is that they're getting, a, that the next door neighbors, uh, Pat Fields is, pay, is paying about 16,000 for 2,500 square feet, mm -hmm. and the people that we have are paying uh, considerably less than that for their space. Great. But that would be probably the going rate for that uh, space in that area. Great, thanks, oh. thanks for your transparency. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, Todd P. gave an interview uh, 
to the Gothamist last year um, that convinced me that between sort of fire code and certificate of occupancy and liquor licenses, that there's maybe like a conspiracy um, by the capital class to um, try to keep young, hungry upstarts from succeeding. And I, I think sort of, and I say that sort of with, with a, you know, with tongue in cheek, but, but also not. Like I, I think like so many creative people who, who have encountered have had, like have just sort of been faced with all these like attempts to be like um, legit and, and, um, and, and just realize that they have, they have to cut corners in order to like make ends meet. Um, so I want to sort of talk about um, going by the book and um, I'm sort of, I'd be curious to hear uh, what rules you've broken. Um, <laughs> yes, me too. <laughs> <laughs> um, what what okay. rules you've broken, uh, to, you know, and, and we can talk about this only in the past. Um, we don't need to talk about things that are currently being broken. <laughs> um, because I'm sure we're all 100% legit now. Um, and so I just want to talk about those sorts of constraints that, that get in our way. And I grant you full amnesty. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'll talk about, so uh, we have a very, very interesting comparison with Old House of Yes and New House of Yes. Old House of Yes being, oh God, like the most illegal thing we've ever done, just, gen just as of five years, <laughs> like breaking the law for five years straight from our build out, from building a third floor without permits, you know, like you need building, per I, right? There's this, yeah. <laughs> it's a thing I've heard of. That you're sp if you're building an entire third floor, you should probably fill out paperwork and apply. And I don't an know about I, an an architect, the structural. Uh, yeah, structural um, stamps. There's stamps involved. Um, <laughs> you can't. There's an architectural stamp. We don't. We haven't. We didn't practice any of this when we were opening house. Yes, we did not have time. We did not have money. We had no nothing nothing on our side besides, you know, community helping us and some, fr you know, some friends who are like, hey, I'm an architect. I, no one can know that I ever looked at this or dr did these plans at all. Like, we, you know, like people are like, don't, don't ever say my name. <laughs> so um, from building a third floor, being way over our occupancy, we had one mode of egress, which is an exit uh, translation. And we were supposed to have no more than 74 people in the building at a time. We would have, I think, 400 at any, more or less, you know, during a larger party. And um, definitely weren't supposed to have people living there, which is what that third floor ended up being, was residence. We, we were not zoned for living um, at all. Um, God, what else? Oh, serving liquor? So, I heard you need a, <laughs> need a license. We successfully, we, um, my partner Anya, who's here, we, we, fooled ourselves for a year and a half to two years that we were not serving alcohol. There was too much at stake to serve alcohol, but we did serve smoothies, and if you paid a little extra, you could have a special smoothie. And it wasn't until a year and a half into operating that I was like, wait a minute, Anya, I think we're actually, like, whether we have a secret smoothie or a full on like gin and tonic, we're breaking the law. <laughs> like, like wait, let's not kid ourselves because Rentals were starting to inquire, like, hey, I would like to rent your space. We need to run a bar for our event. And we would say, no, you can't run a bar. And then all of a sudden we're like, yeah, you can run a bar. And it was, it was very baby steps to be able to say, I mean, by the end of House of Yes 2.0, which is our, um, you know, our most recent House of Yes, um, we were serving, you know, there, was, there were events that had a full bar. Um, but it took a while for us to be comfortable with breaking that law. Um, uh, I mean, that's, I mean, that's just like part of it. I'm sure we broke more laws that we don't even know about. Um, but now version three. Version three. Version three, because there is so much at stake, the laws are changing. There is more, there is more heat. There's more spotlight on these underground Brooklyn spaces, especially in Bushwick. Uh, underground parties are getting busted every weekend. So there's no choice but to go legal when you're trying to make money be sustainable. You know, make sure you don't put tens of thousands of dollars into something and then all of a sudden the, you know, the various departments wipe it away. So uh, we're applying for a liquor license. <laughs> Crazy, yeah. What, what is that process like? Can you, do you, um, have, can you talk about that yet? It's kind of like three steps forward, five steps back, and then two steps forward, and then five steps back, and then 
five steps forward and then five steps. <laughs> it's like it's like one of these things where like we, yeah, it's really comp it's really annoying. Because you have to like file architecture, you have to file plans, right? So you, you have to space. yes, exactly. Yeah. You have to plans in a sea of O, certificate of occupancy, and then you have to develop all these things and they want to see this, you have to go to the community board and the community board can like help you but you don't really need the community board but it really helps if they want you to have a bar in their neighborhood. Then you go to Albany, you submit all your stuff to Albany and a lawyer who gets paid too much is you know brokering all this stuff and helping you navigate that. So it's, that's a process in its own and then there's the building process which of course you need permits for and you need architects, permits, inspections, more plans, more permits, more inspections. Again, two steps forward, three steps back, five steps forward, two steps back. And it's like it becomes mm -hmm. this thing where eventually you get to the end, but it's not a straight, it's not as quick as when you do it illegal. <laughs> so <laughs> because we were up, we were like built up and running within within a couple months. Um, where here it's taking us, it'll be it'll be taking us um, half a year, if not more, to really even get to a point of being close to opening. And I'm sure people have heard of you know, these, uh, these bars and establishments that are trying to open. Oh, we'll be opening soon. So yeah, it's a, it's a process when you go legal. Yeah, I mean, hearing that boils my blood. <laughs> like, like how, hard, like how, how many steps you have to go through to do something so simple. Yeah. Why is that that? Well, <laughs> you know, like, so, I mean, obviously some things are like mire than a long bureaucratic path and, and other things are maybe appropriately difficult to do. I mean, I don't want to, you know, be too much of a, um, you know, uh, Bloomberg nanny state person here, but there's, <laughs> there, there, you know, there's reasons why we have building codes, of course. And, bad things have happened. That's, that's the only reason why sure. we have building sure. codes is because there was a fire and a lot of people got killed or there was a building collapse and a lot of people suffered. And so, um, or there, you know, the, the means of egress, for instance, I know the plan examiners call it means of egress, but right now, like, it's good to know that if this room caught on fire that we could all get out in a relatively safe way, we can see where the exit signs are and so forth. And I get, I, we'll get hurt, so. so I, I mean, I was putting on the spot, but I guess maybe my real question is, how how do we how do we make this easier? How, how do you know, like? What yeah, that's a really good question. Is, is that something the city's yeah. thinking <laughs> about? No, I mean, all right, so obviously we need codes, right? Everybody agrees. I think we, we can all codes, agree right. that that's. But it's just really hard to like get to the point where you've got a approval to do something. Yeah, that is majorly a problem, and I mean, I think that I happen to know a lot of um, people who. Like uh, this group, Architecture for Humanity, helps nonprofits um, do design work and helps them get get hooked up with an architect, sometimes pro bono architectural services, so that they can produce a set of building plans and get up and running. I think they've done this work for like ABC No Rio and some other nonprofits. Mm. Um, so that helps, you know, like that. Um, but you know, the process is still slow. So I don't know. It's definitely something. You know, I'm. Oh, if there's any recommendations or ideas about where you in particular ran into problems with the the building department or other things like that, like we should should let your you know let people like me or you know council members or whoever know about it, so so you can I don't know maybe we could think creatively about how to make it easier for young people to get things started. Because mm -hmm. I think there is some political. Um, push in the last few years. Like, I think there's a real sort of recognition that um, culture, these sort of cultural institutions that are sort of ground up are important and significant. So, right. right? I mean, I feel like oh that's. Oh my God. Like, it's not like the, the next like crappy, like old timey bar that opens up in Brooklyn that's making us all want to live there. It's like the new creative spaces that, um, you know, mm -hmm. offer something different. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, we need more uh, diversity in what happens in the city, more places that are not doing what they're doing to make a buck, but to like, you know. And yet we're still in the same, we're looked at, uh, e even in the Lower East Side at East Village, we're looked at in the same way that any other bar is by these mm -hmm. neighborhood watchdogs who look after the neighborhood. There's no separation. They have such, at this point, they've been so, the neighborhood people have been so beaten down that anybody that comes in, regardless of what they want to try to do, receives the same 
approach. You know, there's no differentiation. That to me is really what could, is a, is a place that could be worked with, yeah. mm -hmm. you know? Just that, if it's a cultural place that's using alcohol or wh whatever, and I'm to, you know, to, as, as a means for uh, sustainability, that it be, that it have some extra, you know, so, some support from the, from the city for that. Or yeah. the priority. Yeah. Like, you know, just being like, if you, if you qualify as a specific organization that's doing positive work that's interesting and not just a bar, maybe you get that little gold star at the top of your application, it gets put on the top instead of at the very bottom. You that's see, because that's it's a mix of profit, nonprofit that right. we're talking yeah. about right. here, right? And I think and that's, that's something that there's no place for anyway. Well, let me problematize this though, because I, you know, I think sort of in between there are music venues, which are you know important cultural in, you know <laughs> things, places, yeah. Yeah. but are you know they have a different com commercial model. They're they're so selling cultural commodities in a way that like that isn't necessarily sort of theater performance or, or poetry. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know, I mean, like, I, I feel like there's sort of, in, th that's really, it's really great. I don't know how yeah, you well sort I of don't, I don't think it's asking too much for the government to have some gradations between those levels yeah. and just understanding what the motivations are of these organizations when they apply for these licenses. I mean, even just us getting like a temporary alcohol license, you know, we have to plan like two months in advance and we only get like three of them a year. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, at some point it just becomes almost not even worth the, the trouble. And it just, you know, it boggles my mind as to why something like that should be as complex. And it's not even just the application process being complex, it's just the organization even understanding what the application process is. That's what we keep running into, where it's like with the rules, I feel like the city doesn't even understand what the rules are at, at times in those situations. It sounds like a good project for another group that we sometimes turn to for clarification on rules that seem arcane to most people, the Center for Urban Pedagogy. Mm. We should get them on this liquor license mm -hmm. thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. or, or maybe if there's a way for organizations like ours to actually like band together a little bit and rather than it just be singular voices every time, like if there was some way that we could have like a collective voice that would, you know, mm. be able, that would probably ring a little more clear to the city. Um, What's interesting well. is it's the SLA, the State Liquor Authority, not the mm -hmm. City Liquor Authority. Okay. So you're, which, you know, which is interesting because yeah. um, there's this thing called the, the 500 foot rule, right? Yeah, so it's, uh, or 200, 500. Yeah, so if you have more than three establishments within your 500 foot radius that serve alcohol, you have to go to a 500 foot hearing. Have you, have you heard this? Yeah, it's part, you know, right? And, this, and of course, so apparently the guy who designed, the guy who like passed this particular rule, like flat out said, I had no idea that this was going to be enacted in New York City, and it, had I known, I would have never passed it. Mm. Because he was passing oh, it for play. I grew up in upstate New York in a very small town. You don't want three bars in a five foot in a five hundred foot radius. Like they were trying to eliminate that. Then he was like, the east you have bar you have a bar on the third floor, second <laughs> floor, basement, yeah. you know, like there's bars stacked on yeah. top of each other in the same building. He, he he was like he gave an interview, of course, after that, being like, No, that's not what I meant, you know? Yeah. So it's interesting. But you know, it is the state. These rules are made by the state and they don't always reflect what's happening in New York City. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. Blocks, right. People are like three, three, three um, temporary permits a year mm -hmm. right, in right, a place right. where I grew up. It's plenty. Mm -hmm. You right. know, people mm -hmm. don't have events where I grew up. <laughs> you know, they don't have gallery openings and fashion shows. They don't. Yeah. They don't have that. It's a very different cultural environment in New York. Yeah. So I think we should have like a, a little state or city bubble of rules. You know. Yeah. No, that's great. I agree with that. Yeah. Um, uh, so <laughs> this sort of brings me to like, um, do you do you do you guys deal with politicians in general? Have you had? I mean, I think like. What we do is like kind of weird and, and a little um, hard for politicians who are thinking about like a bar is a bar um, to sort of understand. Sometimes, have you engaged with community boards otherwise or with politicians? How do you explain what you do? How do you engage with them? Is there any in engaging with a community board? I have found them to be um, ununderstanding mm. in the differentiation in, in what we are. You, you know, even in the place where it is one of the cultural cent centers of the universe, the Lower East Side, it, it just it gets tied up with the economics and with all of the uh, the, the noisome stuff that's connected with the bars. So, so to try to separate out a cultural place that uses a bar for a different purpose does there's no th that 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 seems to be. Uh, too sophisticated uh, uh, to to make that argument. I think we really could use 
support. And Marilyn Chen came and, and saw the place, saw the problems we were, were having and said she would help, but nothing really happened. She's our, our uh, community board mm -hmm. uh, member and, and couldn't really help us, so. Mm. Does anyone else have like supportive um, uh, uh, city council members or anyone that you've engaged with? We, um, my partner Anya and I uh, were part of a Grand Street block party, which was a community summer event where they blocked off the road and had like events for families. We participated performing aerial with our aerial community and just so happened to make a connection with a um, you know, community board member who was organizing it. She's not in our current community board, so the, house of the current House of Yes is in a different community board. But um, it never hurts to have that in your arsenal. Um, I've been to one community board meeting for community board four of Bushwick. It was awesome. It was fun, um, but <laughs> we haven't had to we haven't had to apply yet for our um, you know to actually go and present our plans and get their approval. So we'll see. Um, but we don't ha you know we don't deal with politicians uh, on a on that level. We'd like to. I mean, I I feel like our plan is to show them House of Yes, so that they do understand the, differ the difference between a bar and a cultural space. And, you know, in the future that will be happening, we'll get those connections, but, you know, for now we're just kind of, yeah. you know, yeah. fine. I, I think our, I mean, our experiences with, you know, the, the local poli politicians and city politicians have actually been quite positive for the most part, and we just kind of started talking about the alcohol thing. But, um, you know, I mean, in terms of support after Sandy, I mean, we had three feet of water throughout our whole uh, space in Chelsea, and uh, the city was very generous in helping us recover from that with, mm. with emergency grants and, and emergency funding. Our city council member's office was, was very helpful. DCA has been extraordinarily helpful, actually, in, in mm. that whole process. And, you know, so those, those kinds of interactions, while, you know, complex at times, have ultimately been, been a very positive uh, relationship uh, to the city. And uh, obviously the city's help in helping us get our new home that we're moving into in Brooklyn in 2016 is, is another, you know, positive note on yeah. that. So I don't, certainly don't mean to be, you know, it can all be simpler, but, you yeah. know, that's. Yeah. I, th I, I think the, main problem is that most of the smaller organizations, everybody knows you want to be in touch with these people, but other than putting them on your mailing list, it's one of those things that it's just not direct, you know, the larger organizations can schmooze and have, have enough people on, on, on salary that they can make mm -hmm. those connections, and that's where, right. that's where the money turns. But the, the smaller organizations, you just, you don't have the, the you just don't have the people to, to keep those relationships going. And it's a drag, because we're really important for those neighborhoods. Sure. You know? I'll, I'll tell you something we figured out at, at Flex Factory. So we're, we're very lucky that uh, City Council Member Jimmy Van Bramer is in our district, and he's the chair of the cultural, uh, the whatever the, the group of, that is in charge of cultural things in New York City. Um, in a couple of years, so every year we have a, a silent auction benefit. And um, he was one of our honorees uh, the first year that he was uh, elected. So that's how we were able to um, start that relationship, is, is say, hey, let's Remember honor that, Adam. <laughs> yeah. Honor so, so there, there's a tip. Uh, on, honor your, your local politician in your, in your fundraiser. Cool. That sounds a little yeah. <laughs> Very clever. So you basically, so honoree means like you put, you like, you're like, we're having this event in honor of you. You have to show up. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's <exactly. laughs> like that's, yeah, that's, that's, I don't that's totally like understand. We're not just inviting you. Like, you are the event. <laughs> well, you, you, you ask them, will you do this with us? Right, yeah. but you kind of be like, hey, we're having this event with your name on it. Are you going to come? Yeah. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> that's brilliant. <laughs> Jeez, yeah. yeah, exactly. Wow. Cool. Then <laughs> <laughs> um, I was wondering if you could give us um, some perspective on how uh, space, cultural space has been used in, in the city. We were talking a little bit about um, loft law and, and, and all that sort of stuff. And I, I was wondering if you could give us a, a brief overview, a sketch of sort of how urban designers understand that, that history, that recent history. The recent history, right. Well, I mean, it's really dependent on like the, 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 the creative people and the artists that um, use the space. I mean, I was telling you before the before we started that I think one of the reasons why uh, New York attracts so much, um, so many incredibly talented people is because we have this great like built heritage. So we've got all these amazing buildings and 
in different periods of our history, they've fallen into disuse because the use patterns have changed, so it's left a little bit of space for people to think about the buildings differently. And, um, and because you know we've been able to attract so many bright, talented people, they've been able to come in and do that. I hope, you know, in a city where everything's planned out and every square inch is fought over, how do we like kind of keep that creative void alive is a huge challenge. And I don't know that we have an easy answer for that. Um, certainly, it's not going to come from the government because, you know, um, I mean, it would be great if the government can help to facilitate that, but I think it's kind of up to the up to the visionaries to I, I think maybe my sort of way into that was thinking about how um, code has changed because of the ways that people have been using the spaces like we there's, there's this uh, this uh, term that I find kind of funny naturally occurring cultural districts which is like a way to describe um, spaces that where sort of culture emerges rather than, than uh, which assumes this default that like cultural spaces are planned or like certain neighborhoods where culture emerges are planned um, and, and I feel like there's maybe sort of a history of that, and, and that's the city adapted to that in some way with... Right. With yeah, I'd like to drill down on that, like, that idea a little bit, because I wonder if they are naturally occurring or if they are sometimes by design, and by that I mean by market forces. And, we, you know, so we met, I was talking to you before the thing about Dumbo, for instance, mm -hmm. where, you know, a property owner came and bought up a lot of land that was undervalued in the 70s and then moved in a lot of, gave a lot of space to creative, you know, to Smack Mellon and other kinds of galleries and stuff, and, and kind of seeded this creative class that then later cr created a desirability in the neighborhood and ultimately they, you know, made a killing in real estate there. And so I wonder if those naturally occurring, you know, we think they're naturally occurring, but they may be more occurring as a product of, uh, uh, of um, you know, foresight by, by market by speculators. But in the case of like East Williamsburg and um, and other places further out, I don't know if that's happening or not. I mean, I, I think um, that certainly could accelerate the process, but I wonder if that is a naturally occurring cultural district. And what, what the regulations are that we could kind of smooth or, you know, rethink that would help to get out of the way to allow that to happen? I don't know. That's a good question. I mean, your incentives. Yeah, you know? I mean, and you're telling me that the DCA even has a, a list of, of artists and a definition of what an artist is? Yeah. Can, 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 you, can right. you elaborate on that one? I think it's crazy. <laughs> 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 but, it, I mean, it's an artifact of this moment in history where um, I guess the spaces in Soho were um, starting to be highly valued. And um, so instead of allowing all these manufacturing spaces to convert to commercial overnight, they city created this loft board to help kind of um, preserve the ar artist's use of those spaces. So who's an artist? Well, they had to come up with a definition of artist, and it's really, I mean, it would make everyone in this room cringe, I think. I'm not even sure. Say it. Say it. Uh, even the gist. Well, I think they limited it to visual artists, so already mm -hmm. none of you. What, what, <laughs> 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 oh, <wow. Why? laughs> what, and what decade was this? This is the 70s? Well, I think it was the early 70s, yeah. maybe. Yeah. Mm. Um, and is something like that happening now? I mean, I, it, as like sort of weird as it is to sort of delineate that, I feel like there's, but I feel like there's a real... That'd be a fun project, right? Yeah. To like make a list of all the art artists in New York. <laughs> I'd love for somebody to take that on. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, but I think, you know, no, it's sort of getting so. back to sort of Bob's concern about, like, how do you distinguish between people who are just trying to make a buck at a bar and people who are trying to use the bar as, like, a means to an end for, for their art? I, I feel like, I, is there any sort of thing like this happening in, in the city today, trying to think about that delineation, how you, how you put the gold star on the application? I, I feel like that yeah, is... Yeah, no, that's a great question. I mean, because that kind of gets to the tension of it. Like, if you, as soon as you write a standard, the standard doesn't apply to every situation. Mm -hmm. Like, you need a feeling, thinking individual to be there to kind of assess the situation. But then again, that's not the way that, you know, we, if we had a... And then we'd have just so many people working for the city, I guess, thinking, feeling people. I'm not sure how that would work. You know, like no standard applies to all situations. You kind of got to find your own path and make sure the regulations aren't, you know, like getting in the way. And I think that's why the community board, from my understanding, is that thinking, feeling entity that's supposed to judge 
your your presence, your application, your your um, proposal. And you know, I th you know, because they're not Albany, they are you, you know, like they're and they're volunteers, correct? Yeah. So they're they're there to like be like, wow, you know, like that. That would, that's a nice. I would like that in the neighborhood. Like right. I feel, I think, I feel, I know that this would be a great addition rather than looking at your stats and filing you, right. Right. Um, which can also be tricky as you've experienced because they get hardened and callous and, I think and then they stop think you need some caring. support from the city to, 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 to some place mm -hmm. should, should, should speak about the value. And I think it's, it's important now that, our, that where you see that artists can't live in Manhattan, that they can't live in areas of Brooklyn now, mm -hmm. where they're being pushed out. That that being that, that being the cultural center of, of the globe or something like that is really what's attracting a, a lot the dynamic to New York. And you're not going to have a Broadway if you don't have an off 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 Broadway. Mm -hmm. You know yeah, that's right. the story. Mm -hmm. So we need that kind of support is lacking, or even acknowledgement is lacking right now. Mm -hmm. how, how do people working at the city see these applications when they come in? Is there just a feeling of just general, you know, everyone feeling overwhelmed or just like, I mean, is there, uh, how? Well, so which, I mean, it depends on the application you're talking about. I, I can't really speak, I'm not like, you know, the person that receives the application. I think that, yeah, I mean. I guess I'm asking a, a mood happened. question. What is the mood of the city? About this thing? Like, what is the, like, like what, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> What's that? Like for loft law? Yeah, for, for loft example. law, for, for permits that come in, just for, you know, is it just, is it just a, a work a day thing? Do people ever get excited about things when they see things come in? Do people? Oh, yeah. Definitely. <laughs> I don't know. I know. <laughs> I, I mean, the, this is a dumb I, I question. Think, I don't I know. Think, <laughs> yeah, you, yeah. Some civil servants are just like your loved ones. They're just, <laughs> 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 they get excited. And, yeah. No, I mean, I work at the Department of City Planning, so we, um, we process land use applications. Um, that's like the applications that come to us. So like when somebody wants to rezone a neighborhood and kind of change the underlying patterns of how things are developed, and that usually involves like improving infrastructure and adding new amenities and other things mm -hmm. or preserving neighborhood character. So we get really like, those are all premised on a plan for a city yeah. that is, has been the result of working closely with communities and working closely with advocates. So we get really excited and passionate about those kinds of applications. Liquor licenses, I don't know, maybe that's how the guy that processes the liquor license feels too. Like, oh, I'm really interested in He's really in happy to see this bar. bar to, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've sort of uh, through with my questions. I was wondering if, uh, yeah. yeah, if we could open up. If 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 uh, yeah, if you guys are ready for that, okay. if anyone has questions for any of yeah. anyone up here, uh, we've had some awesome people here in the audience. We've had, we know you have some great questions. Wait, so I, I actually wanted to continue a question that you asked because some people didn't answer. What yeah. laws have you oh, two yeah. broken? We didn't finish. We <laughs> 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 yeah. were so captivated oh by all of I the terrible deeds of the House of I Yes. Yeah. So I never right. want to follow you. On that <laughs> well, I, 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 I just took care of all of them. I was really, really, <laughs> completely moved by the, <laughs> your work. <laughs> yeah. But I, I just, like, I don't think there's many buildings in New York City that are legal. I think yeah, that's the that's basic truth. Okay. Yeah. I think that's true. Yeah. yeah. I think I mean, that's true. <laughs> well, you know, if you look at the, our, like our zoning was written like completely rewritten in 1961 and most so that kind of governs like what you can build where and most of the buildings were built before 1961. So <laughs> they don't have anything to do with like the what you're supposed to put there. And it, I oh, yeah. sorry. I want to say that the, for those who don't know, the very first house of yes actually burned down. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, <that's laughs> so, so as we went, <laughs> did you think about changing the name? <laughs> no, we did. No, we did. Um, wow. for, Maybe the house of maybe. No, uh, for, uh, for about two weeks, we were action adventure. Um, and then, because everybody kept, we kept calling it House of Yes as we were building this yeah. new entity. We kept calling it House of Yes. Friends kept calling it House of Yes. I'm like, no, it's Action Adventure. And they're like, no, it's not. So it was, ha but we had a two week stint um, <laughs> that it was. But that being said, we were very, very aware of fire as a real threat <laughs> 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 because we had witnessed it firsthand. 
and what it can do and how quickly it can happen and how devastating it can be. So we, we, had, we made special, um, just special plans. Like we really actually had like hallways that were actually fireproof, you know, with like rated, um, you know, double drywalled situations. We had exit signs put in, we had fire Dad doors put in. We had, um, what do you call it, uh, fire extinguishers, which we didn't have in the first place. Uh. <laughs> and the fire department ended up, they, they would come by, we would flirt with them, they loved us, they'd hang out. <laughs> so, we, so the laws we didn't, you know, like we were pretty good with the fire tip. Um, yeah. So are we, uh, are we not here? The other, we still haven't heard oh, yeah. from these two. These about guys. This guy doesn't break heard. the law. Uh, no, God, I mean, we just nothing nearly as interesting. I mean, we have artists that, you know, kind of quasi live at IBEAM regularly, and, you know, we're not really supposed to do that, I would assume. Um, and, uh, I mean, the alcohol laws are, you know, we, we have events all the time, and, and uh, you know, the, we try, we actually really try hard to understand what the city wants when it comes to donation versus purchases of alcohol for nonprofits, and it's really hard to get a straight answer on that. So, we're, you know, we, we're always, like, kind of changing the way that our, our little signage, whether it's donation or tip or, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and, you know, trying to keep that in, that in line. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I remember that's remember last year there was a gallerist who was arrested or, or got in trouble for... For this very yeah, thing. that I, happens. Yeah. I mean, it ha luckily it hasn't happened to us yet, but um, you know, it, we hear we hear these little stories, and you know, but but then again, I mean, we we actually it's not out of us not trying to like follow the law. Like often we don't even know what the law is ourselves exactly. when it comes to that that kind yeah. of si situation. So uh, so then we just kind of hope for the best. I mean, I'm sure we've been over capacity in some of the old parties that we used to have. I thought our parties were fun until I heard about yours. Um, <laughs> but, uh, they were fun. <laughs> but. Um, you know, but it's, I mean, our space is a little different though. I mean, it really is just a big warehouse. So it's, you know, it's a little bit of a different, mm -hmm. different situation too. So I would, it's probably easier to follow the laws in that case. Yeah. I actually recommend that everyone tr attempt to read the New York Penal Code uh, <laughs> if, you, if, if you, you know, have, if you're stuck in bed with a broken foot or something. Um, <laughs> it's a fascinating read. <laughs> okay, questions? Who's first? Lana. Hi. Uh, my name is Lana. I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering, when it comes to, to real estate in New York, I think we've, we've sort of touched on this, um, how, and you've touched on this, on how you know everyone's sort of getting forced to, out of Manhattan and parts of Brooklyn and just kind of pushed out farther and farther and farther. I'm wondering w what... Um, what can stop, if there's anything that can stop that or that can work for creatives, if there's any way that creatives can get together and kind of lobby for a space, a lobby for a specific space that is designated for um, as maker spaces in some way. So um, I don't know enough about real estate in order to, to really kind of ask the right questions in that way, but... Just to uh, recap the question quickly, it's basically um, given how real estate works um, and given the fact that um, artists and creative are getting displaced further east, is there anything um, from a city perspective, from a real estate perspective that can be done to confront that or change that or stop that? I mean, the, the tax is, I mean, New York has thrived off of the, um, in part the creativity, as I mentioned, of, uh, of artists to find value in spaces that other people would not. Mm. Where as that starts to um, fade, um, this is a real concern. And then the other thing we thrived off of, you know, going back to the 19th century is the largesse of the ruling class to, you know, hold out a hand and help artists. Um, and that kind of was the case in the, the Bloomberg administration, too, for a lot of organizations. They received a lot of grants, mm. a lot of music exams and so forth. And that. That also might be in danger uh, now, um, as you know. There's maybe not the same level of philanthropy that, that we might have seen in the Bloomberg years. Um, so yeah, is that? It's a great question. You know, I don't have the pat answer. If we, but maybe there are things we could do. We could think about that would be like, um, you know, limiting um, or requiring um, space in certain new developments that would be dedicated for. Uh, for low rents for community artist spaces. And I think that actually does happen in some, you know, like on a one-off sort of um, 
community benefits agreement for certain developments when you do new space. So that, that's, one, that's one avenue. Um, but I think we need to think about more, you know, because uh, you're right that this is, you know, what, uh, what makes neighborhoods really great to live in in New York. I know there's one organization that, that split off from the Department of Culture called, I think called Space Works, mm -hmm. and they work to find artists, like rehearsal spaces, and like affordable studios. Um, but they're, one of my friends works there, and she only works there, like, three, four months out of the year because they can't even afford to fund her to like work there full time throughout the year. Mm. Um, which is like a really good indication of like how, you know, how little this uh, this is like thought about and funded. And yeah. I just, I don't know who we should be talking to or who we should reach out to exactly within the community to, you know, engage with people who know the inside of that and like how, you know, from the creative perspective to the city perspective to the real estate perspective, who, who should be sitting at a round table and having this discussion? Certainly we have a very strong mayor government in New York City, so like getting to the mayor's office and they're not quite, you know, all the way up and running yet. I'm mm -hmm. not sure that they've appointed a new commissioner of cultural affairs. Mm -hmm. So, but you know, that, that will be important. So. Actually, I'd, I'd like to respond to that because I, I also I'm I'm kind of skeptical of um, the model of um, you know you, you can rezone or you can build this big thing but leave some space for sort of cultur cultural uh, institutions or things like that because I I think the brand of, of sort of culture that uh, we are from is much more emergent and because I, I think like those sorts of spaces require that you go in and you know what you're doing and you're set up and you you already have some sort of funding and you're ready to go and I think like it's indicative that the first house of yes was mainly a live a live space, mm -hmm. and and I think like a lot of, um, you know, I think back to music venues again. A lot of music venues are people paying to have a big living room that they can throw shows in, mm -hmm. and some of those sort of you know graduate or sort of evolve to like something like two eighty five Ken, which is sort of evolving into something bigger and like more legit. So I mean, I think there definitely it needs to be space for that, but I'm more interested in like how how policy is set and how. Or, or just how we wrap our minds around that kind of cultural production and, and those sorts of yeah. spaces and creating those sorts of spaces. Yeah, I mean, there are artists doing interesting work around that. I mean, uh, Caroline Willard comes to mind, um, who's uh, really interested in, in sort of collective practices around purchasing spaces uh, as artists. And um, she was a fellow at IBEAM recently. And uh, just, you know, I, I, to me, the most exciting kind of work in that has been from artists themselves, actually. Um, I haven't seen this, the city necessarily being that responsive to those, yeah. those needs, but I absolutely agree with what you're saying. Um, Natalie Jarmajiko did a, a panel with Flux Factory at Queens Museum late last year, and her thesis was basically um, artists shouldn't be spending money on MFAs, they should be spending that money on real estate. Mm. Ha! Yeah. Yeah. Because that has so a bigger true. return. Yeah. You know, so true. The, the, actually, I mean, I, I, don't, I think Caroline talks about this publicly now, but um, the, uh, the, the stipend that re she, she received from IBEAM, and since we're just being very transparent about these things, she worked with us for a year, and we pay fellows $30,000 for uh, the work that they do with us for a year. And uh, she put all of that into a fund to actually purchase space collectively uh, for a group of artists. Cool. Which that was an amazing project. Artists actually. are really good at spotting good real estate, like a generation before everybody else. It's yeah. always gone down that way. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Okay, who's next? Here, uh, we'll, we'll go with you. Um, I'm Anya, I'm a partner in Pulse Yes, and I have a question for you. So there's a really great idea of making somebody honorary at a fundraiser, and then there's the community board meetings. Is there any kind of a um, middle ground between that to really get our voices heard with the politicians. Like, what? I mean, we can write letters. Does that work? What? What would you recommend as the the best way to make our cause known? How do you engage with your politician mm -hmm. or flirt with them like firemen? Mm -hmm. Yeah, flirt with the firemen. That sounds like a good plan. But also, I mean, just do what you do really well and like let you know promote the way that you guys know how to promote yourselves really well. I mean, I think it's something about. I mean, to get into the formal world of you know approvals and grants and all that, you just have to distinguish yourself and be known. I guess that's the most important thing, right? Is just to ex to love what you're doing and excel at it. But I guess how do you promote to those specific people who have uh, their secretary has a secretary? Right. You know, how do you get them to come see your work and participate in a conversation about 
what's actually happening in the... For example, I think what you guys yeah. are doing about talking about during the day, your space will be educational. Mm -hmm. I think like maybe like f strategies like that that sort of address the aspects that are not specifically cultural, they're like wow. maybe family oriented or educational oriented. I'm asking, this is a question more than like a idea. I don't know. I, I think that was really smart. When I yeah. saw, I sort of read what you guys were doing with that. I thought that was a really mm -hmm. smart way to address more of that community. Yeah. Yeah, maybe that's a, that is a good strategy. I mean, it depends on your situation, I guess. But yeah, diversifying so that you become much more of like a community actor. If that's what, if that's what you feel like is needed in the community, that's great. But yeah, I mean, I think there is something about, um, you know, just being really. Um, like promoting yourself, you know, you've got to kind of build a uh, build a, build a case for why you're the greatest Bowery Poetry Club or you know Digital Arts Center or whatever, and that you know you have to you don't have a choice but to support us. The city would fall apart without us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, we have another question up here, Hackett. Yep. Okay. Um, so uh, coming from a couple of things, like whenever I've tried to deal with permits, specifically like fire permits or different things like that, you look into the city code and it's completely arcane, and you call whoever and they don't know, and you run into a building and liquor permit. And yet you see all around you people getting stuff done and people, things happen. So obviously, and this has come to my mind a lot, is who do I bribe? <laughs> <laughs> Cash in an envelope, where do I bring it? So I've got two questions. First, who do we bribe? <laughs> <laughs> so who do we bribe and like, who can bribe us? <laughs> I mean, there actually is a, a job called expediter, right? Right. Is that there is a job. Yeah. The expediter is a bribe, though. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, lawyers like keep themselves employed. I mean, I'm gonna uh, just beat up on lawyers because I, I don't think the, all the blame to lands at the plan examiners at the Department of Buildings. But you know, laws are very arcane and hard to read, and and there's like kind of a you know a self-employment of of people who know how to read them and know how to interpret them and get around them. And you know, those are probably 20 years ago they were probably writing those laws. But but the expediter is a legitimate role. It's but it's only in New York where you have them. Why are they? Why do we have them? And nobody else has to have them. Oh, there's crazy laws everywhere. No, there's no ex. There's no class like expediters in New York anywhere else that I know of. Right. It's unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> it's unbelievable. Yeah. Okay, right here. No, you're yeah, Mm -hmm. I think the question is, there's clearly a difference to someone in power between I mean, emerging true. arts and really established arts. What's, what's up with that? <laughs> right, why has currency to get stuff done and to get like what you need? Yeah. Is that a question or just that, 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 is, a, that is a question. <laughs> Well, I just want, like, generally, we're not like a monolithic thing. Like, I'm not going to go, uh, well, like, right after this, I'm going to the government lecture where there's a panel of artists who are going to, like, make a lot of, and then the government audience is going to make a lot of decisions. <laughs> what did the artists say? <laughs> the artists are always asking us for things. <laughs> <laughs> How do you get the city to yeah. see you? No, maybe, I mean, they need to hear from, from you, <laughs> right? I mean, I, yeah, they probably do have a blind spot to like all the things that they should be doing. Uh, yeah. I, I, can, I can speak from the museum, or working at the museum. Like, I, I do not deal with sort of 
the, the city on that level. But I do know that like the city is also funding lots of you know, museums and sort of larger public institutions too. And I know every year when the budget comes up, uh, city council members are having to think like, am I going to uh, cut a hospital's budget to fund this, you know, this museum more? And like, I don't know. So I, I sort of see from that side too that, that there's a, a lot of things that are being funded and, and cultural to them when they're having to think about hospitals, schools, cultural, like those are sort of the decisions they're having to make. Yeah. Um, Aiden? That is such a great question. I mean, I, I guess I could just I was so away. transfixed oh, by the question, I don't know how to <laughs> recap it. Um, I guess, so, so what Aiden is asking us to do is to look at the flip side of not necessarily looking at the power up above the folks who actually have these venues, but look down and how there's some sort of power dynamic between the folks who have venues and everybody else, um, and how that kind of forges certain kinds of relationships with other arts groups. Um, and then simultaneously the tension to even maintain that space. Um, so she specifically. Yeah, and how discriminating are you? Because I'm also a nurse, you know, it's a very real question. I don't use it in other spaces too, but how do you know how discriminating they are necessarily? Right, so, so then how, how do these um, spaces, what, what are the policies in terms of like, um, who does the space get rented out to or lent out to? Mm -hmm. um, I, what I like about this question is it, also uh, envelops Hackett's question and Lexi's question, which is who do you bribe? And, um, <laughs> and also about emerging artists. There are people, um, my partner and I would get lots of inquiries about people wanting to have their interactive puppet show projection installation <laughs> about <laughs> feminist rights with the animus Oedipus ideals. <laughs> and they've, um, kind of went to art school and dropped out, and now they want to do this thing at House of Yes. And they don't really have a video to show us, because it's, you know, it's total, I mean, we're talking like emerging, like totally working their stuff out. It's a performance, so the thing about performance art is you need an audience or else it's just you in your basement. So it's, you know, and the, you know, we were a lot more open when we first, um, when we first opened House of Yes. We were very open to these experimental emerging artists and we've become a lot more discriminating and when people talk about how do you who do you book like I like to use the word curation we curate who performs in our space our that is our branding that is our reputation and when you put something on stage that you can't stand behind it it um it uh, really waters down the quality of the work and it 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 doesn't do you any good for the future people are like I went to that show house yes it was pretty whack they don't come back so really curating the quality is important. Um, and that being said, it is, it's, you know, it is a little bit of who you know. You've seen people's work and you're like, I like that work, I wanna put that on there. They might even be kind of emerging and you want that on your stage. Um, it does have a lot to do with your personal, it's very personal when you're deciding who you support and who you don't support and who you book. Um, that being said, the future House of Yes will be more available because we're, we're booking out uh, every night of the week, essentially. So before we could, we only had about three or four days out of the week that we could host a, a show or an event. Now we have seven days of programming and we're a lot more open because we don't have to be, um, you know, we'll still have that curation, but we could support people who can't, um, who can't flat out rent the space because we're making money off the bar. As long as those people have their work and they bring people, like, you know, we kind of work it out that way, so. Uh, does that answer your question? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I mean, in our case, I mean, you, you just mentioned Fashion Week. I'm, we do that because they pay us a lot of money, <laughs> frankly, and it's twice a year, and we know when the two weeks are, so we can just plan for it. Um, that has nothing to do with iBeam as an organization, or you know, the kind of programming that we want to support as an organization. 
Um, we have about 400, close to 400 uh, current and alumni artists that we've worked with over the last 17 years. Um, part of being an artist at Ivy means that you can propose programming. Um, so again, like all of our public programming, we try to keep as much as possible driven from proposals that come from uh, artists that have worked with the organization and know the organization. So I mean, just simply from the proposals that we uh, you know, get from them to hook us up with other organizations, to do a collaborative project with another place, uh, we, you know, whatever, whatever form it might take, um, our policy is that, you know, for the most part, we want it to come from, you know, people that we've, we've worked with in the past. I mean, we've, we make some exceptions, but um, uh, generally that's uh, the, the way that we think about it. Yeah, the, the uh, as I said, the old Bowery Poetry Club had 1,500 uh, events a year, so it was running like a music venue, like uh, uh, pianos or Arlene's Grocery, you know, downtown. Um, now the big switch has been, I've had to talk to people like Faceboy who ran an open mic on Faceboy's Follies. You know, y we would love to have your event continue here, but if anybody graffitis the bathroom, you're responsible mm -hmm. for it. And he couldn't take that on and couldn't find any insurance against graffitiing. Um, so that was really drawing the line. But other than that, I'm going to uh, Adam. Could you answer this? How things have changed now? I know that Adam works with arts activism, and, and the guy he's working with, Nikhil, is a poetry filmmaker. You know, writes his poems. So maybe I don't, their their curation is much different from what we were doing. Yeah. Well, hell, I'd say uh, about a third of what we program is our things that we're producing in house. Um, a weekly poetry series that we run, et cetera, stuff like that. I'd say uh, another third, or almost half, comes from uh, this open call for applications that we do, um, of which we get to, we have the opportunity to, to be selective. Um, and how many did you get this last time? Last time, maybe uh, maybe 150, and we took maybe 50 or so. Um, and then. So many people have met Bob in his crazy journeys around the world, and we get a lot of uh, emails from around the world <laughs> with folks who, who want to come and be at the Bowery Poetry. I think what's exciting about our space is that we have the opportunity to program a lot of emerging poets and performers. And then we also get, you know, we get to work with the Romanian consulate or the Spanish consulate when they have a great person come through. So we get to play a little bit high and low, um, and it now works sustainably financially. Mm -hmm. Anya, did you have something to add to that? Yeah, I think that it comes down to, um, I think it comes down to um, seeing how much you can afford to stick to your mission statement. A lot of our mission statements tend to not make as much money, like a theater sit-down show where you have to pay 30 actors and acrobats versus uh, a, a party that hires three DJs and, uh, and then is able to fit, um, you know, two or 300 people standing room versus 100 seats for a sit-down show. Uh, so there's a disparity in just how much money things make. Um, so you try to uh, rent out to the highest bidder who won't destroy your space or graffiti like Fashion Week, which mm -hmm. you know is going to be nice and safe and insured and yeah. high profile, mm -hmm. so that you can afford to do more of the mission statement projects that you really care about. Mm -hmm. um, so we have one last question. Um, I think here. Wait, this guy's had his hand up the whole time. I don't know if you could see him. Um, so I, I actually have an idea for an event space, and um, you know I plan to uh, fund it with alcohol and events, which we do. And um, it's you know, I'm thinking about like seven to eight thousand square feet, ten to thirteen thousand dollars a month in rent. What's the minimum amount of money I need to raise in order to open this place legitimately? Are you asking me? I, I, I think I think <laughs> <laughs> I, I think maybe. Have had experience in opening a place like this with a liquor license, with permits, you know, having to renovate a, a warehouse. I, I think maybe you should come up after afterwards. We're all going to be hanging out here for a bit and ask that question directly because there's no immediate answer to that. Like, uh, come talk to people. I have an immediate answer to that. Oh? <laughs> yeah, Wrong. it depends. Well, it, um, it sounds. Or East Williamsburg. Or uh huh. Yeah, I'd say. But um, the lowest, if you're going like raw, not decorated too nicely, 500,000. If you're going oh. for, yeah. If I mean, I know this because we've been working on numbers for the past month. Um, actually, like. Actually, a lot longer. Yeah, <laughs> a lot longer. But um, 
And that's with like, that's with like a really generous construction person who's foregoing their project management fees, you know, and like really hooking, that's a hookup. Um, 7,500 uh, 750,000 if you're like really um, gonna survive the first year without like, you know, going bankrupt and freaking out and like, you know, things will happen. You need, you need a, a really cushy cushion. So I would say it's only a little less than a million. <laughs> what, what if you went renegade? How much? I think we did it with 80,000 on you. The first? Yeah, something. Some, I mean, the labor was 100% free. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, we were, we were doing demo. I think, uh, um, not counting the trust, it was probably 40,000. I'd say it was about, between, we, we, we kind of were too overwhelmed to count how much money we were spending. <laughs> yeah. Um, We've estimated like 40, 40 for renovation. 40 80, I think. I think 40 for build out, yeah. and then another 40 for lights, theater, like all the things that make it special. Right. Yeah. If, if you don't know these people personally, please come and introduce yourself because you should know them. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I've got one last question for you, which is that we, we asked all of you to be here because all of you are doing some kind of work that we admire in some way. Um, who do you uh, admire in New York? What organizations or what places do you think are being run really well? And who do you think is like, you're like, oh, we're like those House of Yes people. How do they do it? Poetry doesn't make any money. How do they do that? How do they make this work? <laughs> right? so, so, so that's why we asked you to be here. Who, who, who do you guys think is really rocking it? Silent Barn. Oh, Silent yeah. Barn is fucking killing it. <laughs> I'm so impressed with how they manage to have both a performance space and a studio space and a live space and are totally legit. Mm -hmm. it's, it's incredible. It's really what they're doing. I mean, this is different than an event space, but I, I, I'm such a fan of creative capital, and maybe that's because so much of what we do is a residency program, but I think the work that they do is amazing, and I don't know how they do it, but uh, I'm a huge fan. I, I, I think when the history gets written, the people will look at what David White did for Dance Theater Workshop um, in building up and selling <laughs> Off, you know, build, uh, get, selling apartments in order to <coughs> to renovate dance theater workshop, and then see what happened as capitalism went uh, scorched earth uh, to to end that uh, experiment and turn it into what Bill T. Jones is doing there now. That'll be that's one thing, but to me, what the what the um, Fourth Street Arts Block is doing on 4th Street and enabling the theaters there to buy their own space, to me, is truly uh, yeah. visionary and, and, uh, and grassroots. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I love the Lower East Side Girls Club. Oh, yeah, they are amazing. Oh, but I how do they do it? How that's, do they do it? Yeah, it's I mean, like, they're doing, they're doing such amazing work, and they've been doing such amazing work. Uh, Jenny Dembrow, for those who, you know, just got to give her a shout out, um, and all the women who make that happen, and. It's just epic. They yeah. they what acquired and built their own building to do exactly you know like we're, you're talking about when you can design exactly what you want rather yeah. than working with what you already kind of have. It they're they're and just so cool. And it's state of the art. And yeah. they have a planetarium on the top floor. Yeah, which is like, amazing. I don't know how. And I don't know how they. I, I really have no. Idea. I mean, of course, they got funding from all these different ways. And all, I mean, they're they're just. I mean, they're doing such great work, and great work deserves great contributions. So I mean, they've just. Killed it, and I'm sure it wasn't easy. Yeah. Great. Well, well oh, I, I, you, uh, you guys are amazing. I mean, <laughs> I, I think uh, there's, uh, it's, uh, it's great to hear there, there's others out there like you. So yeah, that's awesome. I don't have a favorite. I can't have a favorite. But <laughs> you guys are my I'll, favorite I'll be your favorite. <laughs> okay. House of Yes is my favorite. No, yeah. okay. <laughs> Selling out is easy to do. It's not so hard to find a buyer for you When money talks, you're under its spell Ah, but what do you have when there's nothing left to sell?